Good evening. I'm Belva Davis. Welcome to the world premiere of Day of the Gun. As a television journalist reporting on the explosive events of the 1970s, I saw firsthand the fierce and prolonged struggle which engulfed America and the Bay Area. I covered the free speech movement in Berkeley, the emergence of the Black Panther Party, the anger, protest, and riots of the anti-war movement. Those were dangerous and fearful times. One of the most brutal moments occurred at San Quentin Prison in August of 1971, when inmate revolutionary George Jackson obtained a gun behind prison walls. The consequences were deadly. To this day, it remains a story filled with mystery and suspicion. Because tonight's special contains graphic pictures and descriptions of violent events, viewer discretion is advised. Now, Cron 4 presents Day of the Gun. In spite of all, I am human and have done things that require forgiveness from others. I have transgressed against my fellows in moments of weakness and madness. I hope I can make it. George Jackson. In the fall of 1970, George Jackson skyrocketed to international fame with the publication of his book, Soledad Brother, the prison letters of George Jackson. By the next year, he was dead. George Jackson served a life sentence, which turned out to be a death sentence, for a $70 robbery. The story of George Jackson is a story of the dark side of America. In August of 1971, when Jackson was a 29-year-old inmate at California's San Quentin Prison, he became the central figure in the prison's bloodiest day. Jackson obtained a gun. And in less than 30 minutes, a murderous rampage turned the adjustment center into a slaughterhouse. Six men, including Jackson, were killed. It was unprecedented. It had never, ever happened before. It's never happened again. During his prison life, George Jackson was a polarizing figure, hated as much as he was loved. He was a threat in the prison system. He was one that just what didn't seem to be very afraid. He was defiant, he was proud, he was a revolutionary. George Jackson was a thug. My guess is that he stole lunch money from his grade school um, associates. He educated himself and emerged as the most uh, powerful intellectual within the prison system. He was a punk convict until he was catapulted into the spotlight. Once in the limelight, I think he, he rose above punk convict, but I think he never rose above opportunist. In the end, when George Jackson's cause had been lost and the cult of hero worship contaminated his heart and soul, Jackson sought comfort in a few loyal friends, Marx, Lenin, and Ho Chi Minh, the Vietnamese revolutionary who predicted when the prison gates fly open, the dragons will emerge. On a hot August day, with gun in hand, Jackson would tell the world just that. We realize that we're shedding blood now. We're being killed. 
The ascendancy of George Jackson came at a time when America's soul and its people were coming apart. That this is uh, his revolution. We will not be fooled. The turbulent decades of the 1960s and 70s merged as one. The country's democratic institutions were severely challenged. Some advocated revolution. I'm going to start right now to inform white people of what they don't know. The black people in this country have been the victims of violence at the hands of the white man for 400 years. Un We cannot survive if we go fight some yellow man in Vietnam who ain't never called us nigger. People had marched, people had gone to jail, people were very frustrated and very angry. The unpopular war in Vietnam had become the longest and most divisive in American history. The bitter struggle for civil rights confirmed the failed promise of equality for all. We'd been consigned to the ghetto for years and years and years. We'd not been allowed to break out of the ghetto. Riots turned American cities into burning embers. The political assassinations of Malcolm X, Martin Luther King Jr., and Robert Kennedy deepened the country's paranoia. We were being uh, uh, put in a position of having to feel that our lives were under, under the gun, under the gun. Huey P. Newton and the Black Panther Party wanted justice beyond the streets of Oakland. There were, I suppose, those who felt that all one needed to do was to take up the gun and that that would be the, the path toward freedom. The prisons of California had become a target for revolutionary change as well. The new left viewed the growing convict population as symptomatic of the country's deeper social ills. We've got the militant blacks, the militant uh, Nazis, the militant uh, Chicanos. They're all here under one roof, and we are sitting on this lid like a, uh, like a tea kettle waiting for this, the steam to either come up or the lid to blow off. Inmates were championed as political prisoners, vanguards of the coming revolution, victims of their fascist capitalist oppressors. As long as there is any political prisoner in this country, as long as anyone is being discriminated against, none of us are free. When George Jackson emerged as the new god and leader of the left, those on the right saw him as the most powerful threat in the prison system. I think racism is a control device, control mechanism, uh, create an atmosphere whereby they can control the inmates, control the inmates. And black is just a continuation of the same thing we've been going through on the street. George Jackson was born in Chicago in 1941, one of five children in a poor working class family. His mother, Georgia, was afraid of what the streets could do to him. She wouldn't let him go out and play. She kept him on the roof, you know. She wouldn't let him go out because she didn't want him to get in trouble. I used to tell them that they were black. And in order to achieve, they'd have to be twice as good as white. I said, if you're twice as good as a white in school, then maybe you'll make something. Yes, that's what I used to tell them. It was the truth. So why hide it from them? As a young boy at Catholic school, Jackson experienced racism. The playground was for white kids only. Growing up in the projects, he became involved in petty crime, fighting, stealing. At age 15, his parents moved to L.A. and they settled in the Watts District, where he began to be involved in a little bit more serious crime, stealing a motorbike, breaking and entering. In 1958, he was convicted of a store burglary uh, and sent to CYA, California Youth Authority camp, for several months. He escaped, fled back to Chicago, was involved in a knifing, came back to California in chains. After spending time locked up in the California Youth Authority, 
Jackson graduated to state prison when he pled guilty to the robbery of a Bakersfield gas station. It was 1961. Jackson was 19 years old and he received the indeterminate sentence of one year to life. Well, I was incarcerated under a one to life. A term that called for a one to life where I could have done one year and been released. I've done 10. That's more time than anybody in the state has ever done on a one to life. According to fellow inmate James Carr, when the two became leaders of a gang known as the Wolf Pack, much of her time was spent in the usual convict hustles, gambling, booze, sex, blackmail. He knew how to play the game. He was a tough guy. He studied martial arts. He was, you know, strong, very muscular, very smart, very cunning guy. Good behavior dictated Jackson's chance for parole. It became non-existent. Prison records indicate that he received over 40 disciplinary actions. Jackson spent seven years in solitary. He was a big guy, he was a tough guy. He was, he was a predator when he was in the general population. He, he was a predator of other inmates. He, he, he just abused people. He became a professional uh, prisoner, uh, a real dyed-in-the-wool con convict. And then he started reading um, revolutionary theory. Then he, be, he started reading Marx and Lenin and Mao. And he wrote, I read Marx and Lenin and Mao and they redeemed me. All of a sudden, he had a context for his anger. He realized, you know, why he was there, why people of his, of his race, of his um, working class background, why they were in prison in disproportionate numbers. And that was the appeal of George Jackson. He represented in the most, in the highest way, uh, the injustice of the system and the cruelty and the institutionalized racism of the system. Coming up on Day of the Gun, Inmate killings at Soledad Prison begins a chain of revenge and murder. We now return to Cron 4 Presents Day of the Gun. This program contains graphic pictures and descriptions of violent events. Viewer discretion is advised. We die too easily. We forgive and forget too easily. Gentle and refined people, aren't we? We'll make good communists if someone deals with the fascists for us. In January of 1970, George Jackson was one of more than 2,000 inmates at Soledad Prison. Jackson had been here before. Located 100 miles south of San Francisco, the prison was in the heart of the fertile Salinas Valley, the salad bowl of America, the place where famed author John Steinbeck wrote eloquently of the dispossessed. When Soledad opened in 1951, it was the model for the California prison system, a showplace for reform. By the next decade, that hope had vanished. Well, it was... Gladiator school. Of course, you had your gangs, you had your AB, Aryan Brotherhood, you had your black, your BGF, your black guerrilla family, at the Mexican Mafia. Soledad. Soledad was a racist pit. It was a horrible, horrible place. I mean, the guards set the prisoners against each other. You know, there were conspiracies everywhere. There were stabbings. There were, there were murders. The Guards were the enemy, the number one enemy, because they were killing both of us. And George was trying to explain this to a lot of guys and couldn't get it to their heads. Alan Mancino has spent much of his life behind bars, beginning as a teenager in the California Youth Authority. Like George Jackson, Mancino was from Los Angeles. Though the barrier of race allowed him to know Jackson only by reputation, the circumstance of their prison lives would crisscross in moments brutal and vicious, from Soledad 
to the tragedy at San Quentin. The administration had him down as a troublemaker, as an instigator and an agitator. He wasn't. He wasn't into the racial stuff. I'll say that about it. I went through all the processes. I tried to get out. Uh, I went to school, program. But now on the side, I was studying uh, things that I felt that would help the community. George Jackson was a prisonized, uh, tough, a sometimes brutal prison gangster. And this prisonized toughness made him the best uh, proselytizer for revolution on the yard. At Soledad, the charismatic Jackson conducted secret political study groups with other inmates, trying to unify the prisoner class. He was an internationalist. He identified with international communist solidarity. And one of the projects he took on was that of transforming um, those who were behind bars to move away from what he called a criminal mentality to a revolutionary mentality. And then he had the, the capabilities of mob mobilizing everybody. You know, if he said, hey, we're going to do this here, we do this here. And then when they saw this kind of power that could come from one person, naturally they feared that. On the morning of January 13th, 1970, a new exercise yard was opened at Soledad's notorious O-Wing. The prison grapevine had long predicted that a fight between black and white inmates would occur. Revenge was the motive because of the previous racial killings of blacks. I would say the majority of people in Soledad knew that when the new exercise yard was open, that there would be uh, a fight out there. At around 9 a.m., a racially mixed group of inmates began entering the yard. W.L. Nolan, a prison boxing champion, and Jackson's closest political ally was among them. We said, well, get on the court, the basketball court. Everyone pick your man. When everyone's set, then we'll do it. The guard in the tower was O.G. Miller, white, 51 years old, known to be an expert with a rifle. Miller's background was similar to that of other guards. Ex-military, from a southern state, known to inmates as a racist. He was, he was gonna shoot somebody black. If it was a fight out there on the yard or somewhere, he wasn't gonna shoot his kind, he was gonna shoot the other guy. The fight started when Nolan threw the first punch at a white inmate. Others quickly joined the battle. But as soon as they started scuffling, uh, shots rang out. Without warning, Officer Miller fired his weapon at the inmates. No one was the first one shot. Uh, he was shot uh, through the chest uh, on the first bullet off of a 30 caliber, very high-powered rifle. He was shot right in the heart. It was straight up murder. A second, a second, then a third shot fired, hitting two other black inmates. Both would bleed to death. A white inmate had also been wounded. And even Billy Harris, the one who really hated blacks, uh, said that we thought we were just going to fight. Nobody really get killed. We get, you know, maybe some bruises and head bashing, but that'd be it. Three days later, on January 16th, the Monterey County Grand Jury ruled the killings justifiable homicide. There was just a, a thickness of anger and, and a sense of injustice that had occurred. You just didn't kill us like that. And then dudes were saying, like, damn, we dying. Why, why are we dying by ourselves? And that was the attitude that everybody, you know. Not long after the ruling had been announced, outrage turned into retribution. At around 6.30 p.m., 26-year-old guard John Mills was beaten and thrown from the top tier of Y-Wing. Absolutely in the wrong place at the wrong time. A lot of people were glad. A lot of people were glad, white and black. Mills was killed not because he was Mills, he was because he was a guard, to pay back for the Opie Miller shooting. There was a note left on him. One down, two to go. 
That was, that was stated really clearly. According to prison authorities, there were inmates, black and white, who witnessed the killing of Officer Mills. And the thing that told me was them saying that they could hear Mills's keys jangling in the air as he fell it, or was thrown from the third tier down to the bottom. George Jackson, Fleeta Drumgo, and John Cluche became the primary suspects in the killing of Officer Mills. Cluche denied any involvement. So you were not involved in the assault or killing of John Mills? No. Uh, did you see anyone assault or kill John Mills? No. Do you know if George Jackson, in fact, killed John Mills? No. Jackson, however, was a marked man. According to Alan Mancino, prison guards took him to a secret meeting. They believed Mancino was an assassin for the Aryan Brotherhood. They wanted me to take out George Jackson. They was going to open the cell up and open his cell up at the same time. And they wanted me to take him out. So I got word down to Jackson. That's the first time I've never really talked to him, uh, never associated with him. Uh, I shot him a kite. I told him what was going on in the watch himself, that I wasn't going to do it. A kite is prison slang for a letter. Because I didn't want to kill him. I didn't want to do it. I didn't want to be involved in that. I, I, had, I had a grudging respect for the man. The way he conducted himself, and a lot of people hate him without reason. In February, George Jackson, John Cluche, and Fleeta Drumgo were indicted for murder. Known as the Soledad Brothers, the case of the three inmates would become a cause celeb. John Mills was the first guard murdered at the prison. He left behind a wife and son. Was the incident for which you're charged now, was it a revolutionary act on your part? You're asking me to confess to something? Yeah. <laughs> As Unless decide. you want to, did, did you kill the man? <laughs> Look, uh, uh, one of the most important elements of guerrilla warfare is maintain secrecy. I've killed nobody until uh, you know, it's been proven. And they'll never be able to prove anything like that. Ron 4 presents Day of the Gun. This program contains graphic pictures and descriptions of violent events. Viewer discretion is advised. Dearest Angela, I hope that by some means you have discovered that I love you deeply and would touch you tenderly, warmly, fiercely, if I could, if my enemies were not at present stronger. Black militant Angela Davis was among the most impassioned who rallied to the cause of George Jackson. George himself had become that symbol whom we absolutely had to save. The first time I met him was on the occasion of one of the court appearances in Salinas, California. Davis was one of four children raised in a loving home by her school teacher parents in the racial hatred of Birmingham, Alabama. Acknowledged as a brilliant scholar, Davis studied Marxism and joined the Black Panthers. After a controversial fight, she was fired from her position as an assistant professor at UCLA for being a member of the Communist Party. It was during this time that Davis became involved with the Soledad Brothers Defense Committee and George Jackson. At that time, I thought of him as emblematic of the oppression sustained by by black people. A few of them were in chains. It certainly evoked slavery. Viewed by some as the glamour couple of the revolution, Davis and Jackson formed a close personal relationship, sharing the same vision for political change. And it was, upon seeing him, very refreshing to, to realize that, uh, that he was a human being, that he, was, uh, that he had joy in his heart. Davis also became friends with the Jackson family and teenage brother Jonathan, who idolized George. And 
I think, came to imagine his own life as worth nothing if it could not be used to free his brother. I have a young, courageous brother whom I love more than I love myself, but I have given him up to the revolution. I accept the possibility of his eventual death as I accept the responsibility of my own. In the summer of 1970, Jonathan Jackson celebrated his 17th birthday. Friends at Jackson's Pasadena High School described him as warm, full of humor, never in trouble with the law. He also had an IQ of 117. He just wanted to make sure that George was not kept in jail. He wanted to make sure that, that George was freed. He felt like that George had been done an injustice. Jonathan would write, I have one question to ask all of you. What would you do if it was your brother? Jonathan, being a young guy, and uh, decided that you know he was going to get his brother out of prison by any means he could. And if it meant going there and taking hostages and exchanging hostages for his brother's freedom, he was willing to do that. And that was the plan. On the morning of August 7, 1970, at approximately 10.45 a.m., Jonathan Jackson walked into the Marin County courtroom of Judge Harold Haley. Within moments, Jonathan pulled out a pistol, carbine, and a 12-gauge shotgun. He announced that he was taking over, adding, this is it, everybody freeze. Weapons were given to inmates James McLean, William Christmas, and Rochelle McGee. As Judge Haley, Assistant District Attorney Gary Thomas, and three housewives who were serving as jurors were taken hostage, the gunman also stated, we are the revolutionaries. The Soledad brothers must be freed. Taped under the neck of the 65-year-old judge was a shotgun. As they got out here, then this other uh, bushy-haired, light-haired one came out, he had the automatic weapon. And he came out, and about this time, the one that had the gun on Judge Haley turned around and saw me. And he says, kill that mother. He says, kill him, kill him, kill him. Jonathan and his fellow gunman led the hostages to a van in the parking lot of the Civic Center. By that time, the van was surrounded by various law enforcement people, including guards from San Quentin, who just happened to be nearby practicing shooting. The guards' prison training included the no hostage rule. It meant negotiating for hostages would not happen. With Jonathan Jackson behind the wheel of the van, its human cargo was driving straight into the path of a San Quentin sergeant. He did not have radio contact with the sheriff or anybody else. He did not know that the sheriff of Marin County had said, let the van go. So he told his officers to fire. So they're the two who really fired the first shot and hit Jonathan first. And a lot of the shooting inside the van was done by the assistant district attorney at the time, Gary Thomas. When one of the convicts went down, the gun fell on the floor. He picked it up and started firing, killing the, you know, the other inmates inside. When the gunfire ended, Jonathan Jackson, William Christmas, and James McLean were dead. Rochelle McGee was wounded, as was one of the female jurors. Assistant DA Gary Thomas suffered a gunshot to his spinal cord and would be paralyzed from the waist down for life. In the frenzy of violence, the shotgun under the neck of Judge Harold Haley was triggered, killing him. When a shotgun goes off in someone's face, you can imagine how the, the, the kind of destruction and uh, the gruesome effect of that, and so it was, it was quite a shocking scene. I'm saying that there was no conspiracy, that Jonathan, a 17-year-old man-child, was working according to the dictates of his own mind. George Jackson would later declare 
that he was proud of his brother Jonathan's military action, adding, he was the true revolutionary, the black communist guerrilla in the highest state of development. I'd be the last one to say that Jonathan uh, had suicide in mind. I'm certain that Jonathan felt that uh, the police would have some concern, would give some concern to the lives of those five civilians. I'm thinking that Jonathan was trying to demonstrate, trying to demonstrate to the public, to the people, just how uh, he felt that these problems should be solved. I think that he was led to believe that it was possible, even by George himself. I think George encouraged this. I think George put him up to it. It's very tragic that uh, he died at such, such a young age. I don't think many of us realize how exclusively focused he was on, on George. Nobody knows what he was thinking except Jonathan. But I think he did it for love of his brother and his country. He was trying to wake the people in this country up to the fact that black people had nothing. Because some of the weapons used by Jonathan Jackson were bought and registered by Angela Davis, law enforcement officials believed Davis was a co-conspirator. Davis fled and became a fugitive from justice, the object of a nationwide manhunt by the FBI. Her wanted poster listed charges of murder, kidnapping, and conspiracy. Well, I left because I uh, did not think there was any possibility of justice. I didn't have any choice. It wasn't something I wanted to do. It was something I had to do. You're driven by fear. It, absolutely. Absolutely. Two months later, the 26-year-old Davis was arrested in a New York City motel. After her return to California, she was taken to the Marin County Jail and locked up one floor above the courtroom where Jonathan Jackson had taken the hostages. The Jonathan Jackson thing uh, put us on the alert to specifically it reinforced our belief that there are people out there, radicals out there, willing to do most anything in order to make their point or to free George Jackson. The real fatal irony of the Marin County Courthouse shootout is that after Jonathan's death, George, George Jackson's death becomes inevitable. George Jackson had to transform himself finally into the dragon, the shaman the priest, the convict of revenge. Coming up on Day of the Gun, George Jackson wants... We now return to Cron 4 Presents Day of the Gun. Viewer discretion is advised. Dear Mama, I'm going to night school again and have encountered no trouble of late. They say today is Mother's Day. I can't make much sense of it, though. I love mine every day. You know, there are many black people in this country who have faith in the court. They believe they can get justice. I used to believe it myself, but not anymore. What happens to George now? What, what do you expect? I don't know what happened to George. In the summer of 1970, after the location for the trial of the Soledad brothers had been moved to San Francisco, George Jackson, John Cluche, and Fleta Drumgo were transferred to San Quentin's Adjustment Center, the AC, home to the prison to the prison's most dangerous inmates, where the animosity between guard and convict was mutual. In October, Radical Sheik came to the gates of the prison when a champagne party of 150 people was held to celebrate the release of Jackson's book, Soledad Brother. 
Though some in the prison system would dispute Jackson's credibility as author, the book was the apex of his prison transformation. It was a very personal book, a very novelistic book, and a book that portrayed George Jackson very unrealistically as a victim, a martyr of the prison system, which he was not. If there's anything that George Jackson was not, it's a martyr. Soledad Brother became a sensation, an international bestseller praised by the New York Times. Jackson was called the successor to Malcolm X. Black Panther Huey P. Newton said, George was the greatest writer of us all. George Jackson had the understanding of what comes from the ground. What is the lowest moment in humanity? The letters to my family, my mother, my father, sisters, my brother, Jonathan, they were intended to familiarize them with the situation I was faced with here. Of course, here in prison, we see the repression, the exploitation, the uh, victimization of uh, lower class people. The book offered many sides to Jackson's personality. There were epistles on slavery, the evils of capitalism, adoration for Cuban revolutionary Che Guevara. Jackson wrote often to his mother Georgia, revealing their disagreements and love. He also corresponded with his father, Lester, a man whom Jackson believed had been defeated by a racist society. How do you think I felt when I looked in your face, saw the clouds forming, and see your best efforts go for nothing? I count the times on my hands that you managed to work up a smile. The book was also a public relations triumph for Jackson's attorney, Faye Stender. Stender was tireless in making her client and prison letters famous throughout the world. And she really was involved in making George Jackson a celebrity. Jackson affectionately called the well-known 39-year-old Berkeley lawyer his small but mighty mouthpiece. Afraid for their lives if they testify or are even friendly to the defense in the Soledad Brothers case. Face Stender also convinced a fellow radical attorney, John Thorne, to join Jackson's case, a case which Stender believed needed to be tried in the court of public opinion. She was diminutive, smallish, um, brilliant mind, uh, knew exactly what she wanted. When Stender organized the Soledad Brothers Defense Committee, engaging famous names like actress Jane Fonda to raise money and notoriety, Stender wanted to create an atmosphere of acquittal. It is incumbent upon all of us to speak out about it, to make it known to the public what is happening in this country, that there are political prisoners, political trials. But in the days and months after his brother Jonathan's death, some began to see a change in George Jackson's personality. Exactly like he didn't care about anything anymore after that. He was more introverted. Uh, he seemed like he got irritated at things more quickly and stuff, you know, like one day, I don't know, some guard did something to him in the visiting room and got him a hell of a fight, a hell of a fight with him in the visiting room. Yeah, he changed a lot. Others believed Jackson's years incarceration had limited his real-life view of the outside world. And his idea was that there was an actual shooting revolution going on outside in the streets of the Bay Area. So what we're looking at here is a very, very uh, isolated, restricted worldview, maybe even delusional, one might say. Jackson's relationship with Faye Stender also came to an end. They clashed over the distribution of proceeds from his book. George Jackson said, no, I want to build a revolutionary movement. I'm getting out of here, and I want my money to go towards my friend James Carr, who was a prisoner who had been released, who was organizing and building a little army on the outside. And that's, where they, that's how they parted ways. 
Gregory Armstrong, a Harvard graduate and self-described leftist intellectual, was the New York editor of Soledad Brother. Armstrong was among those who deified Jackson. Greg was definitely a true believer in George. And I remember him seriously asking me one time if I was really part of the group, whether I could help him um, get a helicopter to free Jackson from prison and we escaped to Mexico. During some of his visits with Jackson at San Quentin, Armstrong taped their conversations. The most shocking revelation was that Jackson confessed to the murder of Soledad guard John Mills. Though Armstrong fully embraced the perceived injustice of Jackson's incarceration, Armstrong would deny his friend's appeal for guns. And at some point, George Cook appeals to Greg Armstrong to start bringing him weapons. And George asked a lot of people to bring him guns and various other things. Now eventually, Greg Armstrong was able to say no. He had to say no. He knew that uh, if he did this, there was no going back. In one of Jackson's last interviews, he told a reporter from the New York Times that he would never be released from prison, never be paroled. Jackson added, the whole truth is, I would hope to escape. George Jackson was committed to breaking out of prison, yes. I mean, that's what a lot of people don't realize. He did not believe the system could be reformed by some sort of a showpiece trial of which he would be the, st the star, kind of the, in, this, in a circus. And there was no way that he was going to portray himself as a victim or an apologist for anything that he believed in or anything that he did. Next, on Day of the Gun, George Jackson takes over the Adjustment Center, and the madness begins. To learn more about George Jackson and Day of the Gun, you can log on to our website at cron4.com. An oasis of calm in a frantic world. That's what I call my radio station. And guess what? It's classical music. Classical 102.1 KDFC. A new kind of classical station, hosted by real people. So casual and comfortable, your day may take on the unfamiliar feel of sanity. Classical 102.1 KDFC, because I can use all the sanity I can get. Try it for yourself. We'll be the first to tell you, there's nothing that remarkable about the back seat of an Nissan Altima. Until you realize how far away it is from the front seats. The 2003 Nissan Altima, thoughtfully equipped at $18,999. See it at your Nissan dealer. We now return to Cron 4 Presents, Day of the Gun. This program contains graphic pictures and descriptions of violent events. Viewer discretion is advised. It's going to be, kill me if you can, fool, not kill me if you please. Yeah, I think George Jackson was ready to die. As a matter of fact, what occurs to me is in some ways, the way he spoke, he was already dead. He was past death. August 21st, 1971. It was a Saturday, warm and sunny, a beautiful day in the Bay Area. According to John Cluche, the Sodad brothers were looking forward to their trial just 48 hours away. But in the heat of San Quentin's afternoon, the normal routine in the prison's adjustment center would dissolve into madness. What did he say? Uh, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a blade in the throat of fascism. You know, violent imagery. And that's really what happened on August 21st, 1971. There were blades in the throat of fascism that day. James Park was the acting warden at San Quentin. 
Park and his wife were shopping that morning in San Rafael. Attorney Stephen Bingham was driving from Berkeley to visit his client, George Jackson. Alan Mancino, now an inmate in the Adjustment Center, was in his cell reading a Western novel. One of the officers on duty was Paul Krasnus. Krasnus was a 52-year-old family man who lived in Nevada with his wife and three daughters. He was a very caring father. He would be there when, uh, when I first learned how to walk. Uh, you know, he was there holding me, making sure I was okay, my first steps. Cheryl was the adopted daughter of Paul Krasnus and remembers her father as a man who went to church every Sunday, loved music, and played the piano. He liked to barbecue, he liked to garden, he, he was a country person at heart. After 20 years in the prison system, Krasnus was close to ending his career and looked forward to retirement in Mexico with his wife, Frances. Daughter Elizabeth would not go on camera. The days before the uprising, there was a lot of tension. Prisoners were, were getting out of hand. There were talks of riots. And he even said to my mother once, well, I don't even know if I'll be, if I'll be coming back or if I'll come home. And this was in the week before August 21st. About day, maybe two days before it happened, I, you, you, you seem to grow an antenna. You, you, you know, you can sense something's happening when you're in prison. And you can sense the tension, you can sense incitement, because it's quiet. But you sense something's going on. Yeah, I, I figured something was happening. I didn't know if, uh, what it was, but I knew something was about to go down. No single name would become more important in the tragic events of that summer day than attorney Stephen Bingham. The 29-year-old Bingham was a graduate of Yale University, the law school at UC Berkeley, and once worked in the civil rights movement. On the morning of August 21st, Bingham had not planned on going to San Quentin. A last-minute phone call, however, changed his schedule. A Black Panther wanted Bingham to assist a legal investigator, Vanita Anderson, in her visit with Jackson. Bingham was reluctant, but agreed. She didn't know me from that. I mean, I, neither of us had met each other before. After arriving at San Quentin at around 10 a.m., Bingham and Anderson had their personal belongings inspected by prison guards. But their visit with Jackson was denied by a lieutenant in charge. Bingham protested. At around 1 p.m., Warden Park returned from San Rafael. Park approved the visit. Established policy could not prevent it. Anderson, however, was not allowed in to see Jackson. And then Officer Scarborough uh, asked me, aren't you going to take the tape recorder in? And I said something like, well, I don't have one. And that was when <clears throat> Vanita Anderson said, that, well, you can take mine. And that was apparently what was inside the briefcase. According to Bingham, once inside the visiting room, Jackson examined the draft of his second book. At Jackson's request, Bingham left the room to have Anderson review some papers. Sometime after two o'clock, the meeting came to an end. Bingham and Anderson signed out of the prison at 2.30 p.m. and departed for Berkeley. Do you ever use the tape recorder? No. Do you ever pull it out of the attache case? No. Do you ever transfer a gun to George Jackson? No. George Jackson was taken from the visiting area by Officer Frank de Leon. De Leon was 44 years old, stocky, and the married father of five children. When he arrived at the door of the adjustment center with Jackson, Sergeant Kenneth McRae allowed both men inside. McRae was 39 years old, married, and had three children. Bart Urbano Rubiaco was nearby. Rubiaco was 25 years old and had previously worked at Soledad's Owe. 
According to Rubiaco, as he came face to face with Jackson, he noticed a shiny object in the inmate's hair. And he says, you know, what's that in your hair, Jackson? And Jackson says, nothing. And he, the guard reaches up and he touches it and there's resistance. It feels like metal or something. McRae looked up, saw something similar, and ordered Jackson to produce it. A bullet clip falls to the floor, clatters to the floor. And they, they look at it and they're, what is that? I mean, how could this possibly be? And in the next instant, George Jackson reaches into his hair, pulls out the gun. He has another bullet clip in his hand. He slams the clip into the butt of the 9mm. He points it at the guards and he says, the dragon has come. And that begins what would become a bloodbath. Coming up on Day of the Gun, San Quentin's worst day. We now return to Cron 4 Presents, Day of the Gun. This program contains graphic pictures and descriptions of violent events. Viewer discretion is advised. The bow is taut. It's a beautiful day to die. With gun in hand, George Jackson was in control of the adjustment. He ordered guard Urbano Rubiaco to open the cell doors in the AC. A guy stepped in front of my cell, a black guy, and said, we're taking over, you coming out or staying in? I told him, bust it open, I'm coming out. Some two dozen inmates were released. They come running out. And then after that, it's just murder and mayhem. But what's going on is everyone here is trying to survive. That's what's going on. George had said at some point, even before this, the point now is to construct a situation where someone else joins in the dying. In other words, if you're going to get me, I'm going to take some of you with me. Do you see George with a gun? At some point, yeah. At, after I was out of my cell for a while, yes. I'm not sure which one it was, but I saw him getting strangled. I saw the guy kneeling on his back, and he had some kind of a cord, like from a radio or something. And I think he was gagging and kicking his feet. Uh, and the guy said, this ain't getting it. He went off to get a razor blade or something. He come back this way. Started going off in his throat and strangling him. Another guy was with him. And uh, the kicking of his feet was bothering me, you know, it was like little quick kicks. And uh, so I walked around the other side. You know, I didn't want to watch it. What happened was that the guards were hogtied with electrical cord. Uh, from the radio systems in the cells and then their throats were slashed with um, homemade blades made by made by putting razor blades on the end of toothbrush handles according to Johnny Spain he remained in the area of the kitchen and foyer not realizing that the inmate takeover had spiraled out of control do you know who killed the guards no do you know who assaulted the guards? No. Alan Mancino, however, saw more than he could ever have imagined. The guards were groaning, grunting. They were urinating on themselves. And, you know, it was a mess, man. Uh, you know, it ain't like you see on TV. You know, it's not neat and nice. It's, it's down and dirty. Sergeant Kenneth McRae was bleeding heavily. McCray ends up living to tell the tale and living through it miraculously, even though his th throat was cut from ear to ear. And he's stacked up and the, the other guards are, are, are piled up on, on top of him and alongside of him. 
McCray was laying next to fellow officer Paul Krasnes, who also had his throat slashed. McCray can hear gurgling noises and hearing him say, speak as if he was underwater. And um, he makes one last prayer. Um, May the Lord have mercy on my soul and uh, dies. Moments before guard Frank DeLeon was shot in the head, George Jackson was overheard saying, it's time we found out if this piece really works. DeLeon's body slumped on top of McRae. As Alan Mancino searched for a safe place, inmate Ronald Kane questioned what to do. I said, man, I said, you better get you something to work with. I said, because we're next. You know, and I, w I was talking to him, I was, I was, you know, I was scared, but I knew what was going to happen. They tied him up and they cut his throat. Uh, they came to me and said, you want to be tied up too? I said, no, I'm not getting tied up. Inmate John Lynn suffered the same fate as Ronald Kane. Uh, they're murdered. George gives the order, you know, these guys got to go. They saw too much. They're not one of us. You know, and so these guys become victims just by chance. You hear a lot of moaning, a lot of crying, a lot of begging, a lot of shut up, shut up, and you know, like thuds. And it was pretty bad, man. I was just waiting on it to come to me. 23-year-old officer Charles Breckenridge would become another victim. After escorting inmate John Cluche from the visiting area, both men entered the adjustment center. Breckenridge was seized by inmates. Cluche was uncertain as to what was happening. He moved to a cell on the other side of the AC and sometime later saw George Jackson. He was like he was in a daze. I had never seen him like that. He was just kind of just walking back and forth. He wasn't saying anything. He, he wasn't talking to anybody, he was just walking back and forth, like, you know, he, I mean, just had kind of like a, just a blank look in his eyes. Supervising Sergeant Jerry Graham began searching for his officers. They were gone too long. Graham, the married father of four children, had the door to the AC opened. After he walked in, Graham was taken hostage. The officer who unlocked the AC door looked through the window and saw George Jackson staring at him. You know, at that point, Jackson fires the gun, and that alerts everybody. Moments later, Sergeant Graham was shot dead. When Lieutenant Richard Nelson took a break from painting his house on prison grounds, he heard the sound of gunshots. Nelson walked outside and saw Associate Warden James Park running. Moving very quickly down the hill towards the prison, he said, you better get in there, George Jackson's loose with a gun. So at that point, I made, my, made the decision in my mind to go directly to the armory, grab a machine gun, and go in and find George Jackson, shoot him and kill him. The floor of the AC was covered in blood. Johnny Spain was desperate to leave what he called the chaos. It was at that point that I was trying to get the keys. It's like, okay, this is time, it's time to get this door open and for me to get out of here. That's what it's time for. George Jackson joined Spain near the entrance of the AC. I think the thing I remember most is George, you know, I, I wanted to know if he was all right. You know, are you all right, you know? And he said, yeah, come around. I'm, I'm fine, I'm fine, I got it, I got it. Both have a small bottle of what they believed were explosives. He's got the gun in his hand, and, you know, he announces to his, to his um, comrades, it's me they want, it's me they want. And so he bursts out the door with the gun in his hand and um, starts running across the yard towards one of the walls. As Jackson and Spain ran out of the adjustment center, shots were fired in their direction. Jackson was struck in the ankle. 
and he stumbled and tried to continue, did continue, um, and then I didn't actually see him get hit with the second shot at the moment of impact. Um, I did see him as he stumbled forward after being shot the second time, and when he stumbled forward, he was dead. An officer laying on the North Block gun rail aimed his 30-30 Winchester rifle at Jackson and fired the fatal shot. And the nature of that second bullet was uh, devastating because it entered his back, lower back. As he bent over, leaning forward, that bullet coming at an angle hit the bone and shot straight up and exited his, his skull, killing him immediately. Not far from Jackson's body, Johnny Spain was apprehended in bushes next to the chapel. The smuggled bottle each man carried contained nothing more than water and hydrochloric acid. But the dragon had come. Yeah, there was a lot of frustration, pent up hate, you know, and, and, and finally they bust some doors open. You know, it's, it's gonna come out. Who did you see doing the beating and the killing? Uh, convicts. I got no names for you. I'm not going to give any names. Uh, I'm not going to get anybody busted. I think uh, what happened was going to happen anyway. It was just that time. Next, on Day of the Gun, brutality in the Bloody Adjustment Center will not end. Day of the Gun. This program contains graphic pictures and descriptions of violent events. Viewer discretion is advised. If I leave here alive, I'll leave nothing behind. They'll never count me among the broken men. The body of George Jackson suggested finality, but the Adjustment Center remained in turmoil. Alan Mancino was in a fight for his life. According to Mancino, it was racial, black against white. So I was in kind of like the corner. Four or five of them ran at me and we started fighting. And we fought, I mean, it was like, when you're fighting for your life, it's like you, uh, you don't even get tired. It's just like it's pure adrenaline, you know? And I was fighting, and uh, someone said, they're coming, or something like that, you know? Man's coming, they're coming. Heavily armed prison guards entered the adjustment center. Lieutenant Richard Nelson fired warning shots from his 45 caliber machine gun. There's some interchange. Um, between the inmates and us from the inmates side that they have hostages and they're going to kill them and uh, from our side was well you release your hostages we're coming after you we're going to kill all of you they had a 45 caliber machine gun and they was just shooting up everything you know we were all hitting the floor and stuff they told me come forward your hands in the air and i did that and they snatched me and they ripped all the clothes off me they were beating me right there they had like a little gauntlet. They had shotguns and rifles and side or I never I, I never really know. I, you know, I don't know. You know what I mean? I just like I say, because that day when I looked at him and looked at his face, he just looked like somebody I didn't know anymore. And he just he just looked like, you know, what the hell or something. I don't know. There is a general lockup throughout the institution. Prisoners have been fed in their cells. Tomorrow there will be no visitors at San Quentin. The institution is described as quiet but tense. The six people killed in this riot make it the worst incident of this kind in the modern history of San Quentin prison. 
Most agree the incident was over in less than 30 minutes. It was very, very much like a, like a war. I mean, people, they could smell it, they could hear it uh, outside. It was an earth-shattering, you know, uh, day. It was a terrible day. Six officers had been taken hostage. Three were murdered. Their bodies found in George Jackson's cell. Sergeant Jerry Graham had multiple stab wounds and was shot in the head. Officer Frank DeLeon was slashed, strangled, also shot in the head. Officer Paul Krasnis received four deep cuts through his throat and was strangled to death. The two white inmates, Ronald Kane and John Lynn, suffered fatal wounds to the neck area. The three guards who survived were rushed to a hospital in Marin County for treatment. They were all stab wounds or slicing wounds. Right on the neck. Uh, McCray has one on either side. Uh, Rubiasso has a long cut on his neck and several minor ones at uh, various places on his neck. And Breckenridge is the one who's in surgery now, is in critical condition. He's the critical one. As for Associate Warden James Park, though he tried to remain composed, there were moments when he could not hide his emotions. I think our recent assaults on officers stem largely from this irresponsible kind of blathering about the revolution and kill the pig and this kind of crap. I was angry. I wouldn't have maybe used such intemperate terms, but they were bull dilettantes. Just like the tiger cages in South Vietnam. Not realizing that there's a world out there in which people live or die and uh, are killed uh, for ideas. It was Park who delivered the terrible news to the families of officers Paul Krasnis and Frank DeLeon. Vivian DeLeon, now the widowed mother of five children, was the first to be informed. I went there with a uniformed officer, and as soon as she saw us, she knew what it was, and she started screaming, and she just really went into a hysterical situation and was really unmanageable. We got her to sit down and uh, tried to find somebody, some woman, to come be with her, and find one of the, one of the neighbor women came in to help uh, calm her down. Park then went to the home of Francis Krasnis. Well, I think she handled it very quietly. Uh, she had her girls kneel, and she gave them soda crackers as though they were communion wafers. And I think she, she, uh, she drew on her Catholic resources, and I think that, uh, that sustained her very much. They don't tell me anything. They didn't even tell me he was dead. I found that out on the radio. The Reverend Cecil Williams of San Francisco's Glide Memorial Church was a friend of George Jackson's family. Williams accompanied Jackson's mother, George, to an Oakland funeral home where they viewed her son's body. I raised my children to love people. I raised them to mingle in American society, but American society didn't want them. She hurt deeply, very deeply. It was like, you know, um, she lost George even before he was killed. They couldn't let him live. It, wasn't, it wouldn't be any way possible for them to let him live. He's a black man. And she cried. And she talked to George's dead body. And uh, she said, you know, I'm going to do everything I can to make sure that you did not die in vain, uh, that you uh, did mean something to, to me, your mother, and to, to the community. After that, after August 21st, the prison movement lost, lost its glamour. It lost its focal motor, as George would put it. You know, it lost its, its focus, its superstar. But it also lost its idealism and its romance because this, there was nothing idealistic or romantic about this. This was just plain murder and brutality. 
and it was misguided. I mean, the motivation may have been good. I want to get out. I want to leave the revolution. I want to free my people. I want this is for the greater good. But it turned out to be just a bloodbath in which a lot of people were hurt. Coming up on Day of the Gun, after the death of George Jackson, violence breaks out in the streets of the Bay Area. We now return to Cron 4 Presents Day of the Gun. Viewer discretion is advised. I'm a very simple person at heart. Perfect love, perfect hate, that's the insides of me. The days following August 21st were filled with more outrage, bloodshed, and overwhelming sadness. The funerals for the San Quentin guards were attended by hundreds of law enforcement officials, as well as family and friends. It was a painful, and bewildering time for everyone. I didn't think mom was going to be able to uh, hold up, to be honest. It was, it was very hard on her, very difficult. I think we were all in a state of, of shock. We couldn't cry, we couldn't, we were almost zombie-like. And then as the days went on and we learned of how it happened, uh, you know, it was like, oh my God. It's still in all of our hearts. It's a wound that has never been healed. The family of Paul Krasnus said their last goodbyes at Mount Olivet Cemetery in San Rafael. Not far away, protesters gathered outside the gates of San Quentin. Hundreds demonstrated against what they believed was an ongoing reign of terror inside the prison. There are 26 people locked up, and they are all hurt, and they will not give them medical attention. Gracious physical beating by prison guards with blackjacks, clubs, and guns. And as a person who totally is against bloodshed. Willie Brown was a state assemblyman at that time. I would encourage you not to get any of us killed, including yourself. We went out there uh, for the express purpose of trying to make sure uh, that uh, the system didn't come unravel and people begin to needlessly lose their lives. The atmosphere was tense, suspicious. We couldn't even bury our dead. These people were out there protesting, getting us away from the funerals, returning to the prison, putting on our riot gear and protecting the prison. San Quentin officials were concerned about the potential for violence. We had a number of officers with shotguns in a garage near the gate, and that was the first line of defense because the second line of defense was submachine guns up closer to the wall. And if these kids had actually broken through, it would have been a tragedy. So we got some of the damnedest people you've ever seen in your life working in corrections, and they got plenty of... According to Willie Brown, it was Ray Precunier, director of the California Department of who allowed leaders from the black community to go inside San Quentin and inspect it. What we found, frankly, was what Precunier and his people had said, that yes, there was a lockdown, yes, there had been, you know, incidents, but no, there was not this reign of terror. But the anger could not be contained. Under heavy security on the morning of August 26, the Soledad brothers were driven to the courthouse in San Francisco. The courtroom at San Francisco was tight. Authorities feel violence has a way of following the Soledad brothers. The hearing for John Cluche and Fleeta Drumgo became bitter and erupted into a bloody fight. As bailiffs tried to remove Cluche's mother for creating a disturbance, a scuffle broke out when two black men interceded on her behalf. Members of San Francisco's tactical squad rushed into the courtroom to restore order. 
The authorities cleared the courtroom, called an hour's recess, and began reinforcing security. And this is Tom Snyder, NBC News. Two days later, on the morning of August 28th, bombs went off at state buildings in San Mateo, Sacramento, and San Francisco's Ferry Building, which housed satellite offices of the California prison system. No one was injured. A member of the terrorist group, the Weathermen, claimed responsibility for one of the explosions. A note sent to a local newspaper called the bombings an outraged response to the assassination of George Jackson. The 28th was also the day of Jackson's funeral. This system, called American Justice, murdered George Jackson. The service for George Jackson was a full-blown revolutionary memorial conducted by the Black Panthers. Jackson was a field marshal in the party. The funeral was conducted at the St. Augustine Episcopal Church in Oakland, the same church which held services for his brother Jonathan. Approximately 2,000 people came to pay their respects to the Soledad brother. Panther leaders Bobby Seale and Huey P. Newton delivered eulogies. And we will raise our children to be like George Jackson, to live like George Jackson, and to fight for freedom as George Jackson fought for freedom. The Jackson family sat in the front row, tears running down the face of Lester, George's father. I wish I could give all I'm longing to give. I wish I could live. George Jackson's funeral was the prelude to yet another death. The next night at around 9.30 p.m., gunmen entered San Francisco's Ingleside Police Station. A 12-gauge shotgun was fired hitting Sergeant John Young in the chest, killing him. A letter was sent to local papers declaring the Ingleside attack revolutionary violence for Comrade Jackson's political assassination. Next, on Day of the Gun, six inmates go on trial for murder. Or presents Day of the Gun. Viewer discretion is advised. I know they will not be satisfied until they've pushed me out of this existence altogether. The overwhelming anger and sadness which occupied the days following August 21st now turned to endless questions, accusations, and conspiracy theories. Many were convinced George Jackson had been murdered. George Jackson, field marshal for the Black Panther Party, a soldier in the People's Army, gave his life in an attempt to free political prisoners. Warden Lewis S. Nelson and Associate Warden James W. L. Park, through their agents, did, on August 21st, 1971, killed one George Jackson. I believe they killed him and threw him in the yard. Richard Nelson has always dismissed the notion that there was a prison or guard conspiracy to kill George Jackson at San Quentin. Well, it's preposterous. It, it really is. There's um, nobody, nobody would even consider that or think of it because it, uh, it, 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 it's, it's futile. There's no way you, you could get it done without getting a death sentence yourself. We are satisfied now that it was brought in uh, underneath a wig, uh, and that since we found the wig this morning. There was also the story of the wig. It is an honest-to-God bona fide wig. Prison authorities believed that Jackson was wearing this Afro wig under which the gun was hidden. The San Francisco Chronicle conducted a reenactment. Attempts to hide the gun failed. And when the model walked, the gun wobbled dangerously. 
The distance Jackson had to walk from the visiting area to the adjustment center was approximately 50 yards. Well, you know, they make you, they make us go through all through our hair, all up on the lift, you scrot them all up, and it just sounded strange to me that, you understand what I'm saying? How in the hell would he have a gun getting back to AC, and, and especially with the way they treated us? There was also the appearance of the so-called pants pocket letter. The letter was an exchange between George Jackson and his friend, ex-convict, James Carr, outlining preparations for Jackson's prison breakout. The letter raised more questions. Did the two men plan an escape for August 21st? Or would Jackson make an attempt two days later at the opening of the Soledad brothers' trial? I don't believe that uh, he had any intention of putting the gun in the prison. The only thing that makes sense would have been for him to have produced the gun in court. And when Jackson left the visiting room, was he properly searched by guards before returning to the adjustment center? So I don't know whether we'll ever know what really happened on that day. It was a, it was a moment of horror. As for the gun, state investigators discovered that the 9mm Astra Automatic used by Jackson was purchased at an El Cerrito gun shop two years earlier by a member of the Black Panthers. How Jackson obtained the gun was a mystery. Was it smuggled into the prison by a friend, a guard, or his attorney, Stephen Bingham? That there is no way Jackson could have obtained the death gun except during his w visit with attorney Stephen Bigham just before the killings started. Prison officials and Marin County authorities believed the gun used by George Jackson was passed to him by Stephen Bingham. According to Bingham, after leaving San Quentin, he spent the rest of the day with family and in meetings. When he learned the news from friends later that evening, Bingham was shocked. And it was clearly horrible, um, the whole thing. I mean, it was just um, that that many people had been killed. Bingham was also terrified, filled with fear. That's my state of mind. And the next step to feeling framed is um, I could be killed. Stephen Bingham fled the country became a fugitive from justice and went into hiding in Europe. Bingham and six inmates from San Quentin's Adjustment Center would be charged with murder and conspiracy. Because of our unsuccessful efforts, the state's unsuccessful efforts to locate Mr. Bingham within California, uh, he will be now sought by the Federal Bureau of Investigation. In March of 1972, Soledad brothers John Cluche and Fleeta Drumgo were acquitted by an all-white jury for the death of guard John Mills. In a Santa Clara County courtroom in June of the same year, Angela Davis was found not guilty of the charges of murder, kidnapping, and conspiracy. Davis denied the prosecution's allegations that she engaged in plotting, and arming the kidnap attempt and subsequent shooting led by Jonathan Jackson. Davis called her acquittal the happiest day of her life. Three years later, in July of 1975, at the Marin County Hall of Justice, opening arguments were presented in the trial for the six inmates charged with murder and assault in the George Jackson incident. The accused were Johnny Spain, Hugo Pinnell, Fleeta Drumgo, Willie Tate, David Johnson, Louise Talamentes. They became known as the San Quentin Six. Security for their trial was extremely tight. The courtroom had a bulletproof partition and some of the defendants were in chains shackled to their chairs. There was also a visit by the jury to the scene of the crime. The courtroom came to the prison today. Judge, jurors, defendants, attorneys, everyone. 
Alan Mancino was among those called to testify. The prosecutor questioned Mancino about the statement he signed days after the deadly riot. He says, is this statement true? I said, not. I said, that was a prepared statement. I got tired of beating beat. I said, you got the wrong guys. And I didn't just do it to screw the state. Some of them guys were innocent. I mean, straight up innocent. They didn't do nothing. And they were scared as anybody else in there. You know? Can you say who that was? No, I can't. The parade of witnesses included the surviving guards, Kenneth McRae, Urbano Rubiaco, and Charles Breckenridge. Each man offered damaging testimony. Defense attorneys said they lied. The trial lasted almost a year. In August of 1976, the jury reached its verdict. Johnny Spain was the only defendant convicted of murder found guilty in the killings of guards Frank De Leon and Jerry Graham. Spain, who was also a Black Panther and had run from the Adjustment Center with George Jackson, did not testify on his own behalf. Spain received two life sentences. Hugo Pinnell was found guilty of assaulting two guards, Urbano Rubiaco and Charles Breckenridge. David Johnson was found guilty of assault. He was released from prison because of time already served. Willie Tate, Luis Talamentes, and Fleta Drumgo were acquitted. The controversial and complicated criminal trial of the San Quentin Six was the longest in California history. It was also the most expensive to prosecute. The state had spent over $2 million. Coming up on Day of the Gun, revenge in the years after. Ford store, ain't no doubt my king of the mountains built for tough. We now return to Cron 4 Presents Day of the Gun. Viewer discretion is advised. I have never really lived. In the years after the killing of the three black inmates at Soledad Prison, the trail of blood and revenge led to the deaths of at least a dozen others, inside prison and beyond. Fleta Drumgo, who was released from jail in 1976, was shot dead in the streets of Oakland three years later. Police call the killing a gangland-style execution. Attorney Faye Stender, the true believer who fought for George Jackson's freedom and made him a cause celeb, became another victim in May of 1979 when a member of the Black Gorilla family invaded her home armed with a gun. On the forced entry into the household, uh, the gunman asked for Faye Stender by name. Has her sign a document saying that she betrayed George Jackson? I betrayed George Jack and has her sign it. And then after she signs it, he shoots her full of holes with a handgun. And miraculously, she doesn't die. In January of 1980, Faye Stender's assailant, ex-convict Edward Brooks, was convicted of attempted murder and robbery and sentenced to 17 years. Brooks was later stabbed to death at Folsom Prison. Not long after the trial, Stender traveled to Hong Kong, where she lived alone. In the spring of 1980, paralyzed and in constant pain, she committed suicide by a drug overdose. Faye Stender was 48 years old. Stephen Bingham returned to America in 1984 to reclaim his life, ready to stand trial. I'm very confident um, that uh, a jury is going to acquit me. Bingham's trial began in April of 1986 at the Marin County Courthouse. He denied the allegations against him. By summer, the jury had reached its verdict. Bingham was found not guilty of three counts of murder and conspiracy. It's relief. <laughs> 
It's just joy and relief. I'm vindicated, but on another level, uh, you're never really vindicated. At the age of 44, Bingham resumed the practice of law, and at present is an attorney for a San Francisco legal aid center. A handful of supporters were on hand to greet Johnny Spain when he left the state prison at Vacaville. In March of 1988, Johnny Spain regained his freedom when he was released from prison. Spain's conviction for murder as one of the San Quentin Six was overturned by a federal judge. Today, Spain is a consultant for criminal justice issues and teaches civics at an alternative high school in San Francisco. Angela Davis is a professor of the history of consciousness at the University of California at Santa Cruz. Davis is also involved in the prison abolition movement. Officers Kenneth McRae and Charles Breckenridge resigned from San Quentin not long after their ordeal and eventually departed California. Officer Urbano Rubiaco remained with the Department of Corrections and after a brief time also resigned. Soledad brother John Cluche is an inmate at the California State in Lancaster. Incarcerated since 1980, Cluche is serving a life sentence for a drug-related murder. Fifty-six-year-old Alan Mancino is serving time for armed robbery at the Louisiana State Penitentiary in Angola. Mancino's projected release date of 2007 is a reminder that his years behind bars have been filled with so many forgotten days and nights. But the memory of that terrible day in August, over 30 years ago, will remain with him forever. You don't constantly think about it every day, but when you lay down in your rack at night, you close your eyes, and you get to thinking, we're so-and-so, and, -so, and it, one thing reminds you of another, and there it is. You think about it, and I'm sure every man that was in there that day thinking about it, every one of them know what happened, whether it was on the receiving end or the giving end. To what extent did George Jackson contribute to his own demise? Had a $70 robbery wasted his life? Had years of abuse between captor and captive raged like a sickness, leading to a final exchange of hatred? Placed in the context of four centuries of racial injustice, was August 21st, 1971, a revolt, murder, or one more horrifying symbol of America's historic inability to address the burden.